Night fam, what you're about to hear is the incredible story of a Russian priest and his mystical gift. A man who, according to many testimonies, could turn his eyes black while performing healing sessions. Who brought one of the biggest empires in history to its knees. Who survived being stabbed, poisoned and even shot in the head. And a man who called himself Jesus Christ Reborn. To those he saved with his healing sessions, he was a saint, blessed by God. But to others, he was the devil himself, taking part in twisted rituals, orgs, and even war. And to this very day, many of the things he did are still shrouded in mystery without any explanation. Nightfam, this is the story of one of the most mysterious men ever on this planet. Grigory Rasputin. And it begins in 1869 in freezing and distant Siberia, a region in Russia known for its harsh nature. Now, when you add this insane region to how troubled Rasputin was as a youngster, you get someone very unique. In his youth, he was known for drunken brows, cheating on his wife and stealing anything he could get his hands on. To the people of his little village, he was a local menace, but somehow he always escaped the eye of the law. He was quite clever. That would all change in his early 20s when he stole a horse from one of his neighbors. His first instinct was to flee to the untamed wilds of Siberia, where it would be unlikely he would be caught. Then he remembered. There was a small monastery just outside of his town. And so Rasputin would have to try his luck there. Banging on the wooden doors in the middle of the night, he shouted, Sanctuary, help me, give me sanctuary. And the kind priests inside the monastery took pity on this fearful young man and took him in. Over the next six months he spent with them, Rasputin slowly became more faithful. Faithful. <laughs> Even accepted to join these monks and serve God. Little did they know Rasputin would become one of the most unique priests of all time. For months he traveled the frozen plains, going from town to town and bringing God into people's hearts. His whole belief was that he had to suffer for God, and so he would wear the same clothing for a year or put heavy iron shackles around his ankles when he traveled. All of this was to feel the weight and pain of his past life and his sins. When Rasputin finally returned to his village, he was a completely different man. His hair and beard had grown out long and thick. And immediately Grigory went to work, bringing the word of God to his town. Except, it wasn't really what you would expect. He often said he received visions from God and that he could heal any disease or illness with the power of his faith. And people came rushing for his help. Day after day, this small home in snowy Siberia received guests from all over Russia, who all came to see Rasputin and his miracles. But as the word of his preaching spread, so did the rumors. There was talk that Rasputin had become part of the Listis a religious cult with a dark reputation. Everything, from extreme use of narcotics to even orcs, was said to happen inside Rasputin's homes. But these rumors, true or false, never put Rasputin down. After gathering a bigger following of people, he set his sights on something much bigger. The big city of St. Petersburg. He declared that in his dreams, the Virgin Mary came down from the heavens and visited him with a message. The royal family needed his help. And so Rasputin once again set out into the cold 
To follow the orders of God, shortly after arriving, he began preaching his beliefs. And the fiery and unusual prayers drew the attention of rich, curious people. But above his fiery beliefs and strange look, Rasputin shocked the city with his powers of healing. Until today, no one knows how he did it. During these healing sessions, Rasputin was known to use many strange herbs, powders and chemicals. During his prayer for the sick, his eyes would turn completely black, according to the testimony. And he would enter a sort of a trance, channeling the power of God to help whoever was suffering. But by far his biggest miracle was healing the sick young prince of Russia, Alexei. One day Rasputin appeared before the doors of the royal palace and declared that he had a vision of the sick prince. The sickness was a closely guarded secret and the fact that this poor priest from Siberia knew about it shocked the Tsar and Tsarina. For years they searched for a cure for their son who was suffering from hemophilia. And within just a day of his arrival at the palace, Rasputin threw out all of the family's doctors and ensured he was alone with the boy. And on the same day, Alexei's pain and bleeding greatly reduced somehow. From this point on, Rasputin became a regular guest of the royal family. Here, unfortunately, with all this verified success, is where we enter chapter 2 of this story. Because at this point, Rasputin's true nature began to truly reveal. Witnesses reported that Rasputin forced his followers to bathe him and the drags and all grew in size. And over a thousand women were taken to Rasputin's bed as an act of faith. Many of those women were convinced he was Jesus Christ reborn and they found his fiery preaching irresistible. This mad priest took advantage of people's faith in him and God to satisfy his every desire and all this was without consequence. There were even reports that he would hire prostitutes, then violently beat them in order to drive away the devil from their hearts. The police always kept an eye out for him, but with the friendship of the royal family, there was nothing they could do to stop his preaching. By now, priests were convinced Rasputin was the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ reborn, and slowly began the plans to end him once and for all. Many people wanted him gone, and so, soon enough, while visiting his hometown, Rasputin came across a woman standing and watching him in the street. As soon as he was within reach, a long silver knife flashed in the woman's hands, and with extreme speed, she drove it into his stomach. One, two, Three times she kept on stabbing and stabbing as the blood poured from his wounds and over her cold fingers. Even when Rasputin staggered and fell onto his back, the woman didn't stop. And as he lay there, dying, she turned and disappeared into the night. But as miraculous as his life was, so was his survival. Despite all these stabs that would kill almost anyone, it wasn't enough for him. Rasputin didn't die. And guys, in this part of the story, I want to request from you to follow our page right now if you like what we do and if you still don't follow us. Right here, Project Nightfall. And also this content is exclusively made for a page called After Nightfall, which the link you can find above if you like this type of content. Thank you so much. Now let's begin chapter 3 of this story. While the country was heading into the fires of World War I, Grigory Rasputin was recovering from his wounds in a Siberian hospital. But his deep wounds didn't stop him from influencing the royal family. 
He wrote many letters to the Tsar and Tsarina, urging them not to join the war, and warning of the many deaths and pain that it would cause. Moved by the saving of Alexei's life and the many things Rasputin did for her family, the Tsarina became even more trusting of him. Once he was out of the hospital, Rasputin returned to St. Petersburg and became the Tsarina's right-hand advisor, and he used it with an iron fist. During his two years in power, Rasputin was more unhinged than ever before. He would openly use drugs, his lust for women only increased, and it was well known that he shared the bed with many, many married women of wealthy and influential people. He also appointed people who were incompetent onto positions of great power, greatly destabilizing the already fragile country. Famine, war, poverty, and a raving madman at the heart of the country. All of this sent the people of Russia into a rage, and everyone wanted Rasputin dead, until one man would see it done. Felix Yusupov, Serena's nephew. There were rumors of addiction and sin going around about his wife, and Yusupov invited Rasputin for dinner to help her. But as the dinner went on, Yusupov only watched as if he wasn't hungry, because every food Rasputin put in his mouth was poisoned with cyanide. A deadly poison. But like some anime character with superpowers, Rasputin just consumed much more than any man could, and nothing was happening to him. He just wouldn't die. Shocked, Felix ran upstairs to get his pistol, and as he returned, Rasputin was still there, completely calm and unfazed. He didn't beg for his life or try to defend himself. Yusupov just shot him point-blank in the head. The rest of the night, Yusupov and his people celebrated. After all, they just killed the devil that took hold of their country. But... Something still bothered Yusupov. He couldn't put a finger on it. Something about this whole thing was wrong. Careful, he went down to the basement to check on Rasputin. And as he tried to find a pulse, Rasputin's pitch black eyes snapped open and he lunged at Felix. Terrified, Felix scrambled up to the steps, racing to the upper floor to warn his friends about Rasputin, the devil. Grabbing their pistols, the five men rushed out to the courtyard to find Rasputin limping across the cold snow, blood dripping from his wounds. Without hesitation, the five men shot until their bullets ran out. The people then took his body and threw it into the icy river. The following morning, the body was found. Rasputin's hands were raised like this, as if he was pressing against the ice with water filling his lungs. In the books of history, he is known as the hardest man to kill ever. But he finally died. Many of Rasputin's acts can be explained by science, coincidence or just effects of the many narcotics he used during his life. But one thing will forever remain. He truly was one of the most mysterious men to ever walk among us, and no one will ever really know what powers he really had.